Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Applied Information Show. Today, we've actually got quite an interesting subject. We're going to be talking about travel safely and the connected vehicle applications. And today, I'm joined by Sarah Mulligan, who is the product manager for Travel Safely, um, which is really exciting. Before we get into the interview and talking about all these different applications, um, I, w I do want to mention uh, Zoom has uh, been having some troubles with uh, broadcasting HD quality. So what we've got is we also have this being rebroadcast on uh, YouTube. You'll see in the chat box, uh, there'll be a link for a YouTube link that Jessica's going to send through. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Jessica, who's got some housekeeping uh, for how we're going to do all the questions and everything like that. Hey, everyone. Um, welcome back to the IETL studio. Um, we are going to be doing Q&A as we go along. So if you guys want to use the Q&A button in the Zoom um, toolbox down there at the bottom, that is easier than just typing it into the chat. Um, and then like Peter mentioned, I'll be sending a YouTube link that you can access right now as well as later on um, if you need to leave early for any reason. Thank you, Jessica. So welcome, Sarah. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Awesome, awesome. So, I mean, I know you've been involved with travel safety pretty much from the start. So, how about you tell us where actually travel safety came from? Where yeah. the idea came from? Yeah, so you may have noticed my last name, Mulligan. Uh, my, Brian Mulligan is my father-in-law. And uh, he had been working in the traffic and transportation industry for years and years and years. Um, building companies and he had this idea while he was on the banks of the Zambezi River on vacation actually um, to create a application a safety application that was freely accessible to everybody and he had this vision of the only way to move forward and to reduce traffic deaths and increase safety in our industry was actually to connect everything to everything um, and with that in mind travel safely was born that's pretty cool so um, and, and, and I'm sure a lot of people that are connected here are, you know, they know about connected vehicle applications and, you know, all the different types of talks that have been going on, DSRC, CV2X and all these different things. Um, this was one of the ways that uh, as a company, as a platform, we could reach out to everybody instead of reaching out to a small uh, portion of the audience. Um, so what I wanted to ask you was, how has Travel Safety evolved from the very, very first deployment to kind of where it is now, three years later? Sure, yeah. It's, um, it's been really interesting to watch. The biggest thing has been the sheer number of applications. So what started as a smartphone in a car trying to talk to an intersection. Um, has turned into touching almost every traffic device that I can think of today. Um, so the sheer number of applications in the highways, on the cities, um, we, have, um, can, we have beacons that are connected into school beacons, uh, wrong way detection. Um, we have devices hooked into emergency vehicles. So now Travel Safely talks to all of those things. And what's really cool is it collects all of that data and saves it and stores it and pushes it out. So it, it connects the cities, it connects the highways to the private sector, it connects those to the government sector. And then from there, even we can talk about this later, but it takes that information and we save it and store it for universities. Perfect. So, so actually what we'll end up, in other words, there's a whole bunch more than just traffic signals is what you're saying. Um, and that a city has so many different types of traffic devices. And, and that's not also including, you know, some of the devices like a pedestrian. I consider it, it's not a device, but it, it's another application. Pedestrians, cyclists, all the vulnerable road users were actually the biggest increase in roadway deaths on the U.S. roads and also actually in, in Europe has been vulnerable road users as well. Yeah, that's a huge segment of our user base, actually, um, is people who are running the app on their phones and they're biking or walking, um, and it can alert them that there's a high-speed motorist behind them. They turn, they can look. 
Um, and we can actually save some lives with this technology of actually saving pedestrian deaths um, and cyclists um, as well, because the, the app connects everybody to everybody. Perfect. So before we actually go on and talk about this forever, because I love speaking about it, of course, <laughs> let's go and have a look at a, at a short video just to give everyone a bit of an idea of the kind of applications that we're talking about. Meet Travel Safely, an app that helps you get where you're going safely. Travel Safely works if you're driving, walking, biking, wheeling, scooting, or skating. Get real-time audio notifications Red light. so you can focus on your surroundings. Get notified when you're approaching a red light or when it's time to get ready for green. Get ready for green. Travel Safely works with local emergency vehicles, helping them respond to calls faster. Get notified when an emergency vehicle is approaching. Emergency vehicle front. Or when to share the road with your two-wheeled friend. Cyclist. Vehicle approaching cyclist. Travel Safely tells you when you're passing a school or work zone. And if you need to slow it down. So whether you're on the road or just crossing. Pedestrian. Every time you open Travel Safely, you're helping make a better commuting experience for all of us. Together. Download the Travel Safely app today and join our community of users committed to making our roads safer. So what's great with that video is it really shows that what we're doing is we're bringing the community together as part of the traffic department. And this is kind of the first time that that's happened, that actually, instead of just the community calling up and phoning and complaining about things, they're actually now part of the traffic system. They are providing data into the traffic system and getting something out of the traffic system. Um, so Sarah, do you want to talk us through just high level, touch on a couple of the different uh, applications that we saw there. Right, yeah, so uh, as Peter said, the, the Travel Safely community is what like, we like to call it, is that it's actually bringing people together in this community where everybody is connected. Um, but we saw in there the emergency vehicle preemption, um, and obviously we have Glance, and we have the preemption system there that's got our devices in those emergency vehicles. And that connects the emergency vehicle straight to the traffic lights. But what's really neat is it also connects that to our Travel Safely server. Um, so Travel Safely will also alert cyclists, pedestrians, and motorists who are in the area, beep, beep, there is an emergency vehicle behind you. Um, and this might not seem like a big deal to you because obviously they have a siren, but I've heard stories from disability users and things like that where maybe they're hard of hearing or in the deaf community. Um, and having a visual notification that there's emergency vehicles is huge for them. So j just before you go on there, when you said, you know, obviously there's, what are the kinds of notifications that we get there? Is it a, a you, there's audible, visual, does the phone vibrate as well? Uh, yes, there's a vibration setting we can have, um, but uh, we have a audio, well, we, we designed the, uh, the app as audio first, right? So our concept when we originally came up with Travel Safely is that everything would be broadcast through the speaker of the phone. Um, and so we have both the audio, we have the visual, and we also have some accessibility features uh, where these are upcoming and new for us, but we can actually shake the phone and dictate into the phone. So if, you are, um, if you're differently able, then you need help typing things in. We actually have a shake to uh, input into the phone as well. Um, wow. So yeah, it's multimodal. Okay, okay. Um, so you know, we, we see a whole bunch of applications and we're gonna go into a little bit more detail of all of these applications. We'll, we'll look at each individual application and talk through it. Um, but one of the things I wanted to talk about, you know, in the connected vehicle world, a lot of people talk about DSRC, CV2X, and then cellular to network communication. Now, 
what everybody saw there was pure cellular to network. Now, how do we work, how does travel safely work with a, a DSRC radio, for instance? Yeah, so the cool thing is that we're, we're radio agnostic. We don't care what frequency you're broadcasting on. Um, AI devices broadcast on both DSRC and cellular. Um, and the original iterations of Travel Safely were cellular network only. Um, we were using a cellular network in the phone, and then we were hooking it, that up and talking to the network and then talking back down into the intersections. Um, later versions of our, of our devices actually have DSRC capability um, that then broadcast from our AI device. Um, and then Travel Safely has then been now configured to also accept that DSRC input. Um, with our new onboard units, uh, we actually can take either one of those things. We don't care what frequency you're broadcasting on. Um, in the old days, we had, uh, when you didn't have an onboard unit, we uh, actually configured a Raspberry Pi up with uh, Bluetooth, because the original views didn't have Bluetooth, interestingly enough. And so um, we made that, and then that device actually talked to travel safely. But um, we always figure out a way. So, so what's interesting with that is, um, you mentioned two things. So uh, in previous deployments, what we did was, let's say we had a Lear OBU. And the problem with OBUs is most of them, uh, the USDOT spec, doesn't allow them to have a Bluetooth connection. OK, so what that means is on a smartphone, if you connect the smartphone up, you have to connect it up via Wi-Fi. And then you lose cellular communication because it's connecting through Wi-Fi. The problem with that is, you know, the way connected vehicles works is you want to get long distances and the real-time fast communication. So what we do is, as Sarah was talking about, we had a Raspberry Pi, but with our latest iteration of the uh, OBU that Applied Information is busy building, it has Bluetooth built in, it has DSRC built in, and it has CV2X direct and seller to, uh, seller to network as well. So it has multiple different radios in, and Travel Safely will process whichever message comes in first. Because you know, as you're driving far away from the intersection, it's normally going to be cellular to network. As you get closer to the intersection, it's going to come through on DSRC or CV2X. So the Travel Safely app is a great graphical user interface to show all of these applications. And so on the researcher side, they can utilize an OBU. But actually, purely on the, on the public side, who's probably not going to spend a couple of thousand dollars putting an OBU into their vehicle, they can just use the uh, smartphone application that works on what platforms are we on right now, actually, Sarah? Uh, we're, uh, uh, we're available free on iTunes, Apple's uh, iPhones, and uh, Google Play, so Android or Apple. And is there any places that we've done anything in the dash of a vehicle? Yeah, so this is kind of cool. We've got Ford Sync approval now. So we actually have built a whole application inside a Ford vehicle where we can hook Travel Safely up directly into the dash of the vehicle. So you can get the countdown timers, you can get the alarms and alerts um, that you saw in the video built straight into your Ford vehicle. Um, it's really cool. And the other platform that we're working with is Android Auto. So cars equipped with Android Auto, uh, still working through the approval process on that. But uh, that's our next platform that we're working towards. And that would be completely divorced from a smartphone. You wouldn't need a smartphone. All you would need is your smart car. OK. And, and, and so uh, you said Android Auto. What about um, ever, you know, Apple CarPlay as well? Is that also on the cards? Everybody asks me about Apple CarPlay. Um, and the unfortunate thing is that Apple has a very closed ecosystem. So if you know anyone at Apple who would be willing to, to have Travel Safely built in, please contact me. <laughs> awesome, awesome. No, I mean, there's, you know, obviously there's multiple things. We're also working with the 5G Automobile Association. And, you know, over there, there's multiple car manufacturers that we in conversations with because Eventually, all of this technology is going to be built into the vehicles directly. But one thing that, is, that won't be able to be built into the vehicles directly is when someone's driving a 1950s pickup truck, and he ain't going to change his pickup truck, how does he get connected? 
Sure, absolutely. And the really neat thing about Travel Safely is he's got a smartphone in his car already with the GPS, and it's already talking to the intersections. What's super fun for me is we can actually rebroadcast that 1950s pickup truck, uh, provided it's still running. Uh, we can rebroadcast that location to other users. So because we're talking through Travel Safely, we're talking to the intersection, the intersection now knows where that car is without an OBU. So we can actually rebroadcast its location to other vehicles, whether they're DSRC, whether they're CV to X, whether they're the cellular network to X, you know. So what you're actually saying is what, what we can do is then rebroadcast messages from DSRC to CV to X, from CV to X to seller to network to travel safely and basically create an ecosystem where all of those different platforms can talk to each other. Yeah, and it's not just the vision, it's what we do. <laughs> love it, I love it. I'm learning more and more as I'm talking to Sarah. Um, perfect, so uh, obviously we're talking about how to get things into the vehicles directly. And you know, we, we do see Travel Safely as a great stepping stone because we do believe all of this is gonna be in the vehicle directly. But there's always gonna be the uh, cases of the old vehicles, but then also, how do you deal with a pedestrian and a cyclist? Because they're never ever going to put on a big radio or something like that onto themselves. So do you wanna talk us through some of, maybe just one or two of the applications for pedestrian or cyclist uh, related applications? Um, yeah, so I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about this yet or not, but I'm gonna. Uh, one of the things we're looking into and we're building right now is cyclist priority. So this would actually give, if you're running travel safely on your bike, um, then you would actually get priority at intersections ahead. So what this would do is actually give cyclists more green lights. and. If you've ever biked anywhere with a lot of lights, especially like the Netherlands and stuff, where they've got like a push button or something like that, detecting a cyclist is actually quite hard. Um, so what we've done is essentially taking the detection out of the equation, use the detector cards built into the intersections. Um, and so you're saying that that's basically, let's say I'm a cyclist and I'm uh, cycling early in the morning, and whenever I ride at a, at a red traffic light, I'm gonna arrive at a green traffic light. Yeah, you can, that's exactly it. If you're, if you're a cyclist and this has been configured the way that the city wants it to be like that, yeah, absolutely. So you can make your city a hell of a lot more bike friendly if you can say, all right, bicyclists get green lights. Love it, love it, absolutely love it. Um, and then what about some of the kind of safety aspects on, on pedestrian and cyclists? What are the, some of those safety applications? Yeah, so they're also going to get, I talked previously about the emergency vehicle alerts, um, which are super important when you're biking, when you're biking or walking. Um, you're also, and that's not just fire trucks, by the way. We can install those. We have a couple police trucks and police cars and such. Um, we also have those installed, I believe, in some uh, EMS vehicles. Um, so having the knowledge of where those emergency vehicles are around them is really important. The collision detection is huge. Um, so whether there's a vehicle that's driving behind a cyclist or behind a pedestrian, uh, we have a lot of really complicated algorithms that are going to detect if there's a collision or not um, and warn them appropriately and get them out of the way in time. Um, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, Absolutely. it is. It's cool stuff. It's cool stuff. Um, and we also have a system, our pedestrian crossing safety system, where it's a device that's sitting in the middle of a crosswalk a, a, outside of an intersection. Um, and if the pedestrian has pressed the button, they don't need travel safely necessarily to do this, but if the pedestrian has pressed the crosswalk button and the crosswalk is active, um, then the motorists will get an alert saying, hey, there's a pedestrian in that crosswalk. Some even have video detectors for if there's a pedestrian in a block or whether it's in the, it's in the push button. Um, and then the car will actually go, bop, bop, there's a pedestrian in that crosswalk, watch out on your right. That's awesome. So uh, with pedestrians, so there's, there's obviously a bunch of different pedestrian safety technology. I know one of the other ones is for, that we do a hell of a lot of, which is school zones, which is a high density of pedestrians at specific times of the day that we actually provide an alert then 
for the pedestrian, uh, for the vehicles driving in an area where school children are present. Um, now, one of the things that, you know, I don't generally deal with much, but, but what is it like, uh, in other words, dealing with the public directly? Because obviously this is a public facing app. How do we, you know, and it was, I know you get a lot of calls and things like that coming in from the public, and also requests for new features and things like that. I do, I do. It's always fun to work with the public um, because you get a perspective that otherwise you wouldn't have. Um, you know, in the traffic industry, it's, it, it's the same old guys doing the same old things a lot of times. So you have this totally third person perspective that is not always perfect, but it, it provides you a lot of feedback. The biggest challenge I have is education. Um, so teaching people where and how they can use travel safely. But once they get it set up, it's really special. Um, I actually had, this is one of my favorite stories. I had an 82 year old gentleman in Marietta who had gone to all the city council meetings. And at one of the city council meetings, they were saying, oh, we've got this great new technology. Everybody go download Travel Safely. And so I got this email. It was super sweet from this 82-year-old man. He was like, I am interested in making our world a, a safer place. I want to download Travel Safely, but I can't figure out how to get past the login screen. And his problem actually was with the CAPTCHA <laughs> that he was signing up the form with. Um, but I walked him through it on the phone and he thanked me and, you know, he got it set up with Travel Safely and now he runs around with Travel Safely on his phone um, Love it. in the city of Marietta. So a lot of it's education, a lot of it's teaching people, but a lot of it's also people giving us feedback on how they think traffic could work better. Um, one other instance is we had a gentleman who got an alert on his phone that the intersection was in flash which was true, the intersection was down. Um, so it's flashing the red lights. And uh, our alert had said intersection dark, or I think it was in flash. Intersection in flash, it was, treat it, as a four-way stop. It was intersection in flash, treat as a four-way stop. And the guy writes to us and says, um, excuse me, but it was actually flashing yellow, which means you should not have treated it as a four-way stop. You should have treated it as a- Proceed with caution. Proceed with caution. So with that feedback in mind, we actually changed the alarm because I was, he wasn't, he didn't have anything to do with the traffic industry. He didn't have anything to, he didn't go to city council meetings or he wasn't, you know, in, in, in a university. He was just a regular person running travel safely. So we've actually gotten some cool feedback. So you're saying the app has evolved a lot from public feedback because I remember the very first version of the app said uh, five, four, three, two, one, go and now obviously uh, you did a whole bunch of studies with different uh, different groups where you change the user interface to have five plus ten plus do you want to talk through that process and, and why it was done like that yeah i keep a couple of screenshots on my desktop just to remind me where we came from uh, and it used to have Adam made them for us a long, long time ago. It used to have this beautiful little circle and it would be like five, four, three, two, one, and the circle would slowly fill up based on when the light was going to go green. And we got a lot of feedback saying, this is really distracting and it's talking to me and I just, I turned it off because it was too obnoxious. And so we went back to the drawing board as far as user interfaces go and we were like, how can we make this as informative as possible without being distracting? Because that's the goal, right? It's a it's an application that you're using in your car. So you don't want it big and flashy and moving, which <laughs> I'm a graphics person. I love big and flashy and moving. So for me to have to like not do that was sucky. But um, that's how we came up with the original idea to scrub the seconds a little bit and say 5 plus, 10 plus, 15 plus. And that way we were giving enough information for you to make a decision, but not so much information that it was distracting. And what about, uh, I mean, I know the, the, the showing the green time, that you don't do that anymore, where we used to tell everyone, hey, you've got 14 seconds left of the green light. That's problematic because people will take that, oh, I've got 15 seconds left, and they will gun it, man. <laughs> they will try and make it through that intersection because they know that there's a, the green light's only going to stay green for however long. Um, so that's another thing that, yeah, we, had, we did hide that from the general public. So, you know, a lot of people talk about distracted driving. Um, and, you know, that's obviously a, a big issue. And you talked about it a little bit earlier about how you um, had Audible first. 
but uh, talk us through, uh, you know, do I have to have the app open all the time in front of me? How does the app work? Right. So the idea is we want to give you enough information so that it will affect your decision making process. When is the light going to get ready for green? Where am I speeding? So we want to give you enough information so that you can make an informed decision based on the traffic devices around you. Um, and with that in mind, we designed it that if you want to turn on travel safely, switch off your phone and throw it in your purse, you can. And you'll still hear from the depths of your purse going, beep, beep, speeding in school zone. You don't have to be looking, but we still want to provide you with that information. Um, again, if you're driving up to an intersection and the light's about to go green, it'll go beep, beep, get ready for green, um, which we found is the right balance of informative versus distracting. Um, obviously, we have the audit, we have the visual. Like I told you before, we have hard of hearing and deaf users um, who need visual cues. So by providing multimodal, I think I spoke to this earlier, by providing multimodal levels of alert, um, it allows for them also to have the information they need to make these decisions. Okay, so there's obviously, and, and and we reduce the visual clutter too. Like we don't want you to see big flashing, I think I talked about this earlier, big flashing arrows going red to green to yellow, you know, with fancy animations. We keep it very simple. We show you the green arrows and the red arrows um, and obviously the alerts. So the app, you can run it in the background. It sure. doesn't have to be in the, you can run Google Maps, Waze, whatever you want up there. Yep. But what about, how does it, uh, you, you know, you said there's, there's walking, there's cycling, and there's a motorist. How does it actually, do I have to open up the app each time and click on a cyclist or, or a pedestrian based on what I'm doing? Nah, we detect that automatically. So based on your speed, based on how fast you're going and what direction you're going, uh, we'll calibrate for you when you turn on the app and be like, mm, you're going 40 miles an hour. I'm betting you're not running that fast. So we'll actually calibrate based on your speed of, we think you're a pedestrian, we think you're a cyclist. And anyone can overwrite that. So like if I'm going cycling, I can just click on a cyclist. If, if I you're want. a really slow cyclist, then yeah, we can, we can make sure that. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. That's what, exactly what I want to hear all the time is I'm a nice, slow cyclist. <laughs> but but if, if the traffic signals gave me green lights all the time, that would help. It would, it would, it would all be right, great. That'll make me faster. So now you're a, a statistic queen when it comes to, you know, all these statistics that come back from, from travel safety. Can you share some of the things that, that come back? Oh, I love data. Data is my jam. Um, I was actually a psych major back in college, so me and stats were tight. Uh, but um, so yeah, we were talking about like foreground versus background use, which is, do you have the phone turned off, the screen turned off and in your purse, or do you have it actually open to the app and mounted up on your dash? Um, and we actually found that 93% of our users actually keep it running in the background. So they have it either on Waze or Google Maps, or they have it completely turned off with the screen. Only 7% of our users are actually using it to watch the arrows and watch the countdowns, which is really interesting. That's um, exactly what we want, because that's the whole idea behind Travel Safely is to make everything safer for everybody. And this is a great way of us actually making it safer. Bingo. Um, some other stats. So I pulled the stats from yesterday of who was using Travel Safely. Um, and we had people from Atlanta, Alpharetta, Johns Creek, Marietta, Odessa, Texas, Oahu, Hawaii, New Albany, and Orange County, Florida, all in a single day. So we've got deployments all literally the yeah. across the country. And people are using it across the country. We've had 3,483 downloads on iTunes and 1,800 some odd downloads on Google Play. So we've, we've got a decent reach as well. And a lot of that's localized. So we've got tons of users in the city of Marietta. Um, and we've got a lot of users in the city of Atlanta. This is where we're located, obviously. But this is also where we have our deployments. Um, so yeah, those are, those are some fun numbers. So we're talking about all this data and all the rest, and obviously we collecting this data and we sharing it with other organizations. I know we're working with a couple of different universities, um, University of Florida and University of Alabama, and we're also working with Georgia Tech. Do you want to talk us through 
sort of some of the studies, maybe starting with University of Alabama, in other words, what they doing. Uh, everybody, if you, if you join the show, you've already know about Dr. Alex Hainan, so we're just gonna touch on this. He's a great partner of ours and done great things. So Sarah, what do they do? How do they get this information? Yeah, so we call, it the, we call it the fire hose, where we're collecting all this data from the intersections, from the users, and we take that fire hose and we point it straight at the university for them to just consume and analyze, because that's what they're really good at. And in Tuscaloosa, which is where the University of Alabama is, we've actually installed several intersections um, as part of their connected vehicle project. Um, but what's really cool is they even have a visualizer, so they can actually um, jump on and look exactly where these travel safely users are. I believe it's a little interface where you can even see the little dots on the map going boop, 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 which is really fun to look at. Um, but that allows them to give good decisions on green arrivals, like when you arrive at an intersection, is it green when you get there? Um, but it gives them just tons of really raw data that they can do lots of fun stuff with, that they can change their timing plans, they can do all kinds of stuff with this data to let people know how people are using connected vehicle technology. And talk us through University of Florida. I know they did a couple of different studies which are actually quite interesting. Oh, can, yeah. can you talk us through that? These were even more fun. So they actually set up an eye tracking system where they measured where exactly a user was looking. And they had travel safely either in the foreground where you can actually see whether the alerts are coming through or they had it in the background and they were trying to figure out where the eye tracking was when the alerts were coming through specifically for motorist to uh, pedestrian collisions. So they were trying to figure out if I'm about to hit a guy, how long does it take me to look at that guy and figure out, ooh, I'm gonna hit him? And does travel safely help you determine that that's going to happen or not earlier? Does that help you with the decision-making process to slow down, to change course? Um, and they found that it did, it was really cool. Um, so based on their input, that our application was actually helping people see the pedestrian and get out of their way sooner uh, we actually did some uh, tweaks for algorithm, actually, that we were alerting people 10 seconds ahead of time, being like, hey, in 10 seconds, you're about to smash your car into somebody. <laughs> and we thought that was enough time for them to, uh, to make a new decision of, oh, I better slow down. But um, the university gave us feedback and said, 10 seconds is actually too long. By 10 seconds, I've already like, made my decision. And at that point, I just kind of like, it's buzzing in my ear because it's still on, what would really help if it was closer to the time of boop, boop, pedestrian five or even three seconds right before I'm about to, before the collision is detected. So in other words, there's some great information from researchers that have spoken to us and actually provided us the feedback of when to provide the alerts and also people to actually see, one of the things from the study was they actually showed when someone gets an audible alert in a school zone, they slow down by five to seven miles an hour. Audible alerts work. The same thing uh, was for collisions with cyclists. People immediately slowed down and their eyes started tracking before they saw the cyclists, and that's where the four seconds came from, is they said the eyes would track, they would see the cyclists, they would spot onto the cyclist, and then they would continue driving along and move around that cyclist. So I think there's, you know, there's, there's great collaboration. We love to collaborate at, at Applied Information, obviously with universities and with the public. So what I would like to do is I'm gonna go off and, and show you guys what it's like driving around. Unedited video uh, of us just driving around in, in City of Marietta. And then after that, we're actually gonna jump into some of the individual applications and start talking about it. So uh, this is actually uh, coming up to a traffic signal and you can see the phone interface obviously sitting there up there on the dash, but also on the left-hand side showing you 10 plus seconds before it's going to change, seconds to green. And then it's gonna come up with a audible alert. Get ready for green the get ready for green, and you see how the signals go green. This is running everything on the cellular to network side. As you're driving up towards the next signal, it automatically connects in, 
and now you can see it's five plus seconds and the signal is just about to change as you see it there's the signal changes to green and now we're driving through the green traffic light so it automatically connects now this you could be running in the background as well you can see this one's five plus oh, it's about to change ahead of us and now it's green and the left turn is green at the same time so we drive past the signal you'll see that the display disappears and then as we drive up towards the next signal the display is going to come up for the next traffic signal and connect us up to the next one and what's interesting here is we can see our straight is green but it's 50 plus seconds on the left turn now we're going to continue going straight over here and we're going to turn left into this intersection and what we're going to see down here is we've set up a uh, school zone over here where you're going to get an audible alert if you're driving too fast in the school zone. Uh, what will happen is it will only provide you an audible alert if you're driving more than five miles above the posted school speed limit and if the actual speed school is in session right now. So as we drive there, you can see it's a 25 mile an hour. And if we drive over 30, speeding in school zone, pops up with that alert. So, and then as we're coming up to the next traffic signal, you can see it's 90 plus seconds before it's going to change. And uh, I think we're driving a little fast towards this one. Red light. And it pops up with a red light warning over there. So you, you get a good idea of a, a number of these applications um, that, you know, that we're showing you. We showed you the get ready for green, the countdown timers, and speeding in a school zone. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll jump into another video where uh, um, Sarah's going to explain some of these things uh, as we go through this. Um, let me go queue up the video here and I'm going to play and I'm going to pause and, and go through this video as we're going through it. So this first one over here is just showing connected vehicle demos. Get ready for green. I'll get ready for green. And this is the signal phasing and timing over here. I'm going to hit pause for a second there and you'll see that there's, there's a traffic signal there and we're showing you the left turn and the straight. And as we continue playing here, you'll see the green. You see how much real time that really is. Yeah, I was about to say, the really cool thing there is how synchronized the phone and the light at the intersection is, is that you can see there's very little delay, even though it's all cellular network. Um, there's very little delay between the light going green in the real intersection versus what's on the smartphone. What is the delay? very very minuscule it's milliseconds of delay um, okay so so the delay is, is about uh 250 to 400 milliseconds but your eyes looking down from the phone up to the traffic signal don't actually show you you know that you can't actually see the difference it's happening so quick and and the most important application out of all of those is the get ready for green you'll be amazed at the frustration levels that that reduces at a traffic signal when you know uh, before the traffic signal is going to change because I think you've got young kids Sarah I've got young kids and what happens when you have young kids they scream in the back of the car and you turn your head around and you go shut up um, and then all of a sudden the light is changing and people are honking their horns behind you that's where that get ready for green application comes in so nice that you can return to driving and it gives you a great warning uh, that's coming through there. Yeah, I'd like my 60 seconds to know that I have time to pass the goldfish back. That's, that's perfect for me. Okay, so now one of the other ones is, is red light running that we, we saw in the video there that I'm just going to show. And this is a great little video because it shows you driving in bad weather and what you actually see as the driver. Red light. And you can see that that red light warning over there comes through and 
provides you with enough warning that you can slow down, but doesn't provide you with a red light warning way out either. Exactly. Um, and we keep track of those alarms. So when that alarm gets logged, a beep beep red alert, red, red light alert, um, we actually save that information off. We randomize it every 10 minutes, so it's never traced back to you, so don't worry about that. Uh, but we do keep track of which intersections are getting the most red light running alarms so that we can know if there's a timing issue or if that intersection is in a curve or something like that where we might need to put another more signage saying light ahead and things like that. Um, so that's really helpful in terms of low visibility situations like you were talking about with bad weather. You know, you can be behind a truck and it's tough to see sometimes. Great point, great point, because that is actually something that happens a lot is visibility of the traffic signals is never perfect. There's a lot of times you're driving around a curve, bad weather, that you're actually having an additional, it, it's like, you know, someone said, to, said this to me, maybe it was Brian Mulligan, uh, which was, this is the first time traffic signals have changed in a hundred years, because traffic signal, you're not only using your eyes, to see the traffic signal, you're now using your ears. We're now using two sensors to actually interact with the traffic system. So it's a, it's a major paradigm shift when it comes to traffic signal operation because your body works on all the sensors and inputs we receive. Let's go have a look at the speeding in school zones. And this is another one, bad weather over here. You can see there was a signal flashing up there. As we drive in, You'll see the speed limit, which is 25 miles an hour. Speeding in school zone. And there's an alert that pops up. And you'll see here, there, if you look in the top left, you'll actually see the speed as we hit over 30 miles an hour. Boom. Speeding in school zone. The alarm occurs. So, you know, th those are some of the uh, uh, pedestrian speeding or speeding in school zones is one of those ones that really, really has been effective for us. Um, we've had so many people reach out to us because, you know, when I'm driving in a new area, I'm so focused on where I'm trying to go and sometimes I don't see the flashing beacons. This is a secondary warning system and the great stuff is, you know, the University of Florida did a whole study and showed that people are slowing down by five to seven miles an hour and we all know collisions with pedestrians, the slower you drive, the higher the survivability is. And the other important thing is, it's only alerting you in two conditions. If the beacon's actually on, so you're driving by a school, but you're also driving by a school during the posted time. So you don't have like a sign next to it that says when kids are present or between nine to 10 and 10 to 11 and four to six, you know? So it, it's only alarming you when it's actually important to understand that there are kids present that it's within those posted times and that you're going over the speed limit. So both of those things have to happen for it to alarm. That's a great point because, you know, I think that's actually really critical because you don't want to warn someone when the warning's not necessary. And if someone's driving under the speed limit or just two, three miles above the speed limit, we're not going to do anything. It's only when they're driving more than five miles above the speed limit posted in the school and the beacons are on. Great point, Sarah. Um, the other well, thing I wanted to talk about really quick with the school beacons is the other point that we've recently introduced is uh, multi-language support. So, you know, we've talked about accessibility for everybody, you know, especially the public. Um, so now, if you don't speak English and you're driving through a school beacon zone, it will actually, based on what language your phone is in, it will actually alert you in your chosen language that you're speeding in a school zone. So we've got Spanish. Korean, Vietnamese, Afrikaans, Russian, uh, Hindi, and, ooh, I'm missing one. Oh, French Canadian, um, so a German as well. So we've got a number of languages that if you're speeding through these zones, um, Travel Safely is actually going to alert you in your language. Wow, okay. Second thing I've learned today, thank you, Sarah. Um, <laughs> so multiple different languages. So in your community, obviously there's lots of different people speaking different languages and whatever setting their phone is on then, that means they're getting the alarm in their own language, get ready for green in German or in whatever language it is. I, I'm not gonna try to say that. Um, <laughs> okay, so one of the other applications that we've queued up here is pedestrian collision alerts. And pedestrian collision alerts 
are the same for pedestrians as well as cyclists. So you see there, far ahead, we get that bing ahead that there was a pedestrian about to cross there to alert us. And the pedestrian themselves also gets an alert that, uh, there's, a, that there's a vehicle coming that's, that's going to have a collision with him. So, Sarah, do you want to, should we, I mean, I know that the pedestrian alerts and the cyclist alerts are very, very similar, but you also spoke about another pedestrian alert, which is, I know in, in Gainesville, Georgia, you've been working on some of the stuff where uh, that's actually providing a, an alert for when there's a pedestrian in the crosswalk. Yeah, so actually using the terrace detectors that are already in the, in the intersection in Gainesville, um, the terrace detector is basically just a little camera It's pointed at the crosswalk, and so it detects whether there's a pedestrian crossing the road. Um, that input then gets fed to our AI device, and our AI device will then tell travel safely and be like, hey, there's a pedestrian in this area. So as you're driving as a motorist using travel safely, if you come up to that intersection and there is a pedestrian sitting in that crosswalk going slow right in front of you, it'll go beep beep pedestrian ahead. That pedestrian does not need to have a smartphone on him. That pedestrian does not need to be using travel safely. It's being detected by the ATERIS detector built straight into the intersection. Um, wow. And so not only does it alarm and go crazy when you're about to blast through the intersection and it detects that you're going straight ahead through that intersection and there's a pedestrian there, it also detects if they're going to be on the right or on the left. So if you're making a left, a protected left turn, or if you're making a right turn out of that intersection, it's gonna let you know there's a pedestrian on your right and it'll tell you, it's on your right, it's on your left. So you know for that, I think it's called on block, in block crossing, um, where that pedestrian is and to slow down and to be aware. Cool, I like that. All right, let's have a look at the collisions for cyclists. So obviously we're connecting to a cyclist, the vehicle's going to get alert and the cyclist's going to get alert. So this is us inside of the vehicle. You see the cyclist ahead, boom, cyclist. three to four seconds away from the cyclist, we're providing that alert. And it's the same thing on the, on the cyclist, you see it moving over as well, uh, he had a nice drain over there. Um, so you know those are, those are alerts that are provided and the whole idea is to provide additional layers of safety for cyclists, pedestrians, and if this technology can help prevent one collision, we're happy. Um, you know, those, these are things, the statistics of cyclists and pedestrians of getting hit by cars have gone drastically up, and it's really something that we're trying to do as a company to reduce these number of accidents. Yeah, there's, a, there's an initiative called Vision Zero, right, where there's this idea of a future where nobody dies from an automobile accident nobody dies as a vulnerable road user. Um, and to get there, the first step is connecting up everything. And the first step is giving people more information and putting that information into the public's hands. That's gonna be key. Um, we're not saying we're gonna get there <laughs> from, from just using travel safely, that's not it at all, but it is the stepping stone towards that vision zero that we are working towards. Perfect, perfect. Now, the next couple of alerts that I'm gonna show you is speeding in, in, sh in sharp curves, where we can warn you about speeding in a sharp curve. There's also, um, uh, there's another one in between here. So um, speeding in sharp curves, uh, speeding in a work zone, all of those kinds of things are very, very similar alarms, uh, but all very, very important to, to warn people of dangerous roadway conditions. Yeah, absolutely. So we put a box in anything on the highway or in the city that might have a status associated with it, whether it's a work zone, a sharp curve, like you said, um, or even wrong way detection. If there's a device out there or an area that's dangerous to the public, we want to alert them and let them know. Um, and the back end of that is basically mostly beacons, to be honest with you. Um, and we connect those beacons up into travel safely and say, bop, bop, there's a curve ahead. And then the little flasher for the curve warning is actually hooked up into travel safely. But yeah, those, there are 
um, a variety of uses for those beacons, including railway flashers as well. Um, so when you have the little beacons that say railroad ahead, we also alert you, hey, there's going to be a train coming up. Might want to take a different route. That's awesome. Um, so when those trains are crossing the, the, the freight trains, we can actually warn people ahead of time that a freight train is stopped and blocking an intersection. Use an alternate route. Um, Can't tell you how many times that happened to me in Swanee. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, we've also got a number of other applications like uh, rear end collisions. So as you're approaching this car coming up ahead uh, and it's stopped and you're not stopping, it's going to actually give you an alarm to break to stop ahead. So that's when two people both have the apps connected. And as I said before, there's also a number of different applications like slow speed alerts and um, uh, slow speed alerts and road work alerts. What is important behind this is we can actually provide the slow speed alert at these areas where you're going to have, um, you know, Speeding in yeah, you're driving zone. past a driver feedback sign and you're driving too fast, slow down. Work zone speedings is another one of these ones. Um, if I jump back into this video over here, you see there's actually a work zone ahead. Um, and this is driving Speeding along North Avenue. Zone. Speeding in a, in a work zone, slow down. So there's a lot of different applications involved in all of these different um, in, in these different devices that get connected up. Important to note over here, I know Sarah was talking about, you know, we've got devices going into different things. Even when there is no device, we can also set up virtual zones like a uh, virtual wrong way on ramp or you're driving wrong way down a one way street. Um, so there's a lot of things that we can do to add layers of safety. We don't know all of those problems of where everybody has accidents in the city, but the city can let us know and we can create these safety areas for them within the city. Um, I, I don't know if that last slide had a DMS or not, I couldn't tell, but one of the other cool things that we do is a DMS enunciation. So that DMS is a dynamic message sign. Uh, which is one of those big signs you see on the side, either on a highway or it can be a trailer uh, sign that's being called behind a truck with a sign that is, oh, are you going to bring up something cool? Uh, I can show everyone what, what we mean by the, by the DMS sign. So you'll see here, you know, this is obviously wet roads ahead. We'll actually enunciate the message that's on the DMS sign to the roadway user. Yeah, which is really cool. So as they're driving along, their phone will actually speak out loud, wet roads ahead, expect delays. Um, we use Siri speech to, or text to speech. So whatever you put up on that sign, we'll just go ahead and, and read it out loud using the phone's built-in feature. We had a fun one when we were in Marietta. They put up on their DMS, Choctober event. And Choctober is a made up word. It doesn't mean anything. It was a, it was a fun event in the city of Marietta and their DMS was ha said that. And Siri got it right for the first time in forever. Uh, <laughs> actually read out loud to me, Choctober 2017. I was like, are you kidding me? That's absolutely awesome. So there's another uh, number of different applications that we're doing on, you know, like flood warning. So if the roadway is flooded, we'll actually provide you with a flood warning message. Um, and, and then, you know, there's other applications, work zones for highways. You'll see that's the kind of work zone alert. Um, highway emergency response vehicles. So actually providing alerts that a highway emergency response driver is active ahead to provide that information to the road user traveling up ahead so that they get a warning that there's something happening ahead of them. This is the wrong way applications that we were talking about, where we actually provide two alerts, one for the person driving up the wrong way on the, uh, in the wrong direction, and also for the driver on the freeway for doing, uh, you know, for driving in the wrong, wrong direction. Um, we've got about five minutes left. Jessica, I wanted to check in if, if, if we've got any kinds of um, questions that are coming in. All right, Jessica, over to you. Yeah, so 
Um, you guys were talking about um, all the different deployments that we have um, around the country, and someone is asking, would you suggest that a city markets travel safely to their citizens if they only have a partial deployment of the intersections within their city? That's a great question. Um, we've, you know, we've got a number of cities that obviously have a partial number of intersections connected. You know, there's a lot of easy ways of going out and getting the message. Applied information will help. We'll get people involved uh, in terms of, uh, we've got a fantastic communications director called Bill Wills, who um, is able to get connected with the, um, the media, and also, you know, ways of getting it out on your social media and things like that. Because what ends up happening with travel safety is it drives it through to the, um, you know, to the mayors, to the citizens, and to, um, you know, the, the, the council members that they then assign, hopefully, more money for your city, for the traffic department, to go out and get a complete deployment. So my view would be absolutely yes. Market it out. You don't have to do something too big, but you're going to get a number, enough people online that they're going to drive the demand for the traffic department and to the mayor and to the council members that you'll end up getting that need for people to jump in. I'd also just like to add that uh, we have a marketing pack, one of my hats at Applied Information is Marketing. Um, so we have a pack of things that we can help provide to the cities if they are interested in promoting this with videos that you can put your own city's logos in. We have got printed brochures and materials. We've got help articles and things to help get the public educated. So we've got lots of tools out there. All you need to do is just reach out and chat to me. <laughs> All right, I'm going to see if this works. It, it might not work. Bill, you're going to have to let me know if this is working. This is uh, going to see if I can play a video that you talked about earlier which is a, um, uh, it's, it's actually a cyclist detection and one of these new features that's coming out. And you'll see here, there's a cyclist approaching a traffic signal and it could, and it's 60 seconds before the signal is gonna change. So you see the signal's red there. And as the cyclist is coming up to the signal, we're gonna look inside of the traffic cabinet and we'll see there Boom, something changes. And you see how the time change there from 30 seconds and then get ready for green and the signal's going green. This is a way that actually cyclists are gonna travel along and get green lights by us connecting directly into the traffic signal to actually get that information. It's the same thing we're already doing right now with vehicles to actually get, you know, when, when you're driving late at night and the traffic signal's red, and, and you arrive a bunch at the traffic of signal, and guess what? You wait another 10 seconds as you stop there before it goes green. It, with the Travel Safely app, you can actually get a green light before you have to stop. And I think that's really exciting where we're really connecting in with the traffic, uh, with the actual people and the public now. So that's where the real set, exciting thing comes from. And it's a point of pride for the city, saying that we are the most bicycle-friendly city. We promote the health and wellness of our cyclists, and we promote cycling in our community. Absolutely love that. Um, so we've only got about a minute left. Uh, Jessica, I don't think there are any more questions. So I want to thank Sarah for joining me today. It was fantastic. The time flew by. <laughs> thank um, you for having me. And I think, you know, th there's a lot of different things uh, happening in the industry. This is one of those exciting things. Um, what I do want to say is next week, we're going to be doing another great session uh, with uh, uh, the City of Atlanta and Kerry Lord that's going to be speaking to us. So please sign up for, uh, for that session. Um, going to be really interesting talking to them about what, they, what projects they've been doing, what their future is, and, and where they're actually building everything to. So with that, thank you so much for joining us today, and until next week.